The following is an excerpt from Apocalypse Awakening. For the full story, check the link in the description below. He could curse the ungodly time he had woken. The cold, the mist, the hangover, walking through this forsaken city again, he could curse it all. But right now, Fen only had energy to curse the worse aspect. The company. Everyone back there, keep up! Especially you. Bingo narrowed his eyes at Fen before turning back down the road, forging a path of whacked branches and thickets with his gun's bayonet. Last night's rain had served another platter of moisture to coat every surface for the early morning, and Fen's trousers were slurping up the leftovers. Legs soaked through to the thighs. His wet socks encouraged extra soggy thoughts. Why did Bingo say, especially you? It wasn't like he was falling behind their jolly party of eight members. There were two people behind him already. Why me? Fen asked, his voice clapping from a row of plastic road dividers. Kofai, who'd been ogling every wreckage of skyscraper creeping past, didn't seem too concerned of his plight. Why me what? Why is it me Bingo's picking on? I can understand he's pissed off his friend died, but how come he's not giving you any flack? You know, this would be a great area for a run, Kofai said. I reckon it's because he sat next to me in yesterday's meeting. The only problem is all these potholes and plants would get in the way of a good track. I mean, if he'd sat on the other side of the table, say next to you, I bet he wouldn't give a damn about me. He's just taking his anger out on whoever happens to be in the line of fire. Actually, I need some better trainers before I even think about making it out this far. My current pair keep giving me blisters. Why are you talking about trainers? I'm dealing with a genuine dilemma here. I can't have Bingo out to get me. It's too much hassle having enemies. Would you stop moaning? You're giving me a headache. No one said you had to catch up and listen. Fen snapped at the newcomer. Kofai gasped. Fen! I thought you didn't want any more enemies. I don't. Then why are you insulting the broken hand? Who's a broken hand? That would be me. Fen gave a proper look at the new man walking to his right. Dirty blonde hair sat atop a blocky head and a bulging set of muscle, obvious even underneath the thick fur-lined coat. The man wasn't naturally large like Bingo. In fact, he was the same slightly underwhelming height as Fen, but his torso ballooned way out of proportion to the rest of him like a bodybuilder's. I see a scar. Fen nodded towards the gnarly line running the length of the man's face, partly obscured behind a pair of dark wraparound shades. But no broken hand. The man lifted the arm hidden by his right side, revealing a metal clamp with three serrated prongs in place of his hand. Well, that'll do it. You should stop complaining, the broken hand said in an accent far too reminiscent of Tonkai's. Fixating on such small things distracts from real problems. Problems like that one? Fen motioned towards the assault rifle strapped to the broken hand's back. Don't tell me that fires ordinary bullets. So what if it does? I don't need to carry a blaster rifle if we're dealing with just one man. Seemed Fen was right about him being a bodybuilder. Why else would someone carry around such an outdated and heavy weapon? Don't underestimate this one man. He's a demon that's already survived a match with a proper weapon. Your pea shooter's not gonna do a thing. The metal hand, was that his name, snorted. If he's really as strong as you say he is, then she'll deal with it. Who? Hey. Wow. A woman with sharp angled features had emerged on the other side of Kofai, stomping along at the edge of their little group. She looked to come from the same gym as her buddy, but with extra height to complete the package. And, just to go the extra mile, a massive blaster launcher sat atop her shoulder. The tubular launcher was easily three times the size of Fen's comparatively piddly BR-16. You're a bloody big one, Fen remarked. Carrying that thing for both of you? The short-haired woman shot him a glare. Be careful, Fen, Kofai whispered. They're both ex-frontliners. Frontliners? 
Fenn hadn't met many of the only people crazy enough in the freelancer ranks to take contracts fighting on the front lines for warring factions. She's the strong hand, Kofai added. Just how many damn hands are there? Only us two. Enough to keep an eye on you. She spoke with a blunt accent, far too reminiscent of... Ah, shit. You work for him, don't you? That twitchy-eyed bastard. Tonkai, yes. We are his hands. Fen grimaced. I always thought Tonkai's hands was some shit band he tried putting together. Keep making your little jokes. The hook hand again. But make sure your business isn't so funny. We've got our eyes on you. Join the club. Fen quickened his pace, putting distance between him and the trio, sticking his foot in a muddy puddle in the process. What a horrible morning this was turning out to be, and soon they'd arrive at the city central square where the infamous spy droid lay. Hardly a pleasant prospect, having to walk by that creepy hunk of long dead metal. Three people were ahead of Fen, circling a vine-tangled bus. Bengo's massive frame was obvious enough, but he didn't recognise the bald tanned man or the white cloaked figure walking next to him. How had the person with the white cloak managed to avoid getting a single splatter of mud on themselves? Fen felt his own shoes being weighed down by the wet, squelching clumps clinging to his soles. And why were there only three people ahead of him? Was there not eight people in the... Fen! He jumped from the man who'd soundlessly slivered next to him. He wished people would stop surprising him like that. Didn't help that this man already knew his name. Hi. Fen realised he didn't recognise the man. Someone else he must have forgotten. Sorry, I can't remember your name. Oh, don't worry. I know who you are, but I assure you, we've never met. Fen glanced sideways at the man. Took in the smart shirt, well-kempt hair, and crisp winter jacket. You're well-dressed for a stalker. The man let out a soft chuckle. If you consider the gathering of information to be stalking, then I suppose you can call me a master of it. So you're a master stalker, then? Another chuckle. No, no. My name is Massif, and I, Fen. I'm going to change your life. From the black, someone spoke. Can you hear me? You need to wake up. All that pain and darkness. He must have died and passed on to the afterlife. To be greeted by God. Or maybe multiple gods. He had looked forward to finding out if there was some other place waiting after death. Somewhere he'd been sending so many others. Wake up! Michael sat up, the shout ringing in his ears. He stared, but couldn't see anything. He hadn't expected the total nothingness of the next stage. Perhaps this was purgatory. Was it meant to be this cold and so... rusty smelling? I can hear someone approaching. Judging from the rhythm of footsteps, these are no wandering strays. The mysterious being inhabiting this realm had a strange way of talking. It slightly echoed in an otherworldly fashion, as Michael would have imagined, but with a harsh and unfriendly male voice. I had to wake you early before the final calibrations were completed, so you'll have to make do. Calibrations? What god talked about calibrations? Get up! You have to get higher and find a vantage point. Hello? Michael said aloud. His voice bounced and flared around the empty space, gravity to its presence. Not like the other voice, devoid of echoes. Where are you? Inside your head. God? I'm flattered at the presupposition, but I'm afraid I'm just as capable as you of perishing if you don't get us out of our current predicament. Michael hesitated. Presuppo... What? Move! Now! Michael stood and immediately began to sway, unable to grab his bearings in the void of darkness. Where should I? One moment. 
Light burst around Michael, burning his retinas as the universe imploded into a dazzling whiteness. What's going on? he asked, trying to shield his eyes. It was useless. His eyelids had no effect on blocking the whiteness that stung as badly as if staring directly into the sun. Hold on, I'll adjust your eyes. Adjust my... The blinding white dimension dimmed into a world of cool grey corridors with smoothed edges that stretched and twisted in either direction. What did you do? I'll explain later. You need to move. Where? The ladder, to your right. Climb it. Is this the way to heaven? The voice fell silent. Michael's arm suddenly, viciously, flared in a spasm of pain. Shit! He clutched at the arm, found it had stopped throbbing, the pain already retreated to wherever it had come from. That hurt me just as much as you, but trust me, I'll do it again if you don't do as I say. Michael silently cursed the voice and its stubborn impatience. And what do you want me to do? I want you to pick up your weapon and kill the approaching enemy. Upon hearing the last, all too familiar order, Michael realised he must still be alive. Seemed his duty wasn't over yet. What's this guy's name again? Masif, that's my name. He said with a wide, slimy grin. I can tell you've forgotten it already. A common trait of yours, Fen. Most people forget a name the first time. True, but I know of your particularly bad habit for it. As you can tell, knowing habits is part of my business. Fen sighed. He didn't like this smooth-talking know-it-all. Why couldn't he bother someone else and leave Fen to lament the day in peace? Kofai's laughter echoed from the trio further back in the street, his brays reverberating down the empty city block. He could at least pretend to take this demon hunt seriously. You can tell, can't you? No one is approaching this task with the proper gravitas. Fen wished Masif would stop accurately guessing all his thoughts. It was becoming very tiresome. In fact, no one has taken any aspect of running the freelancers seriously for quite some time. You don't say, Fen murmured, checking his watch. Even if they didn't find the demon, they should still make it back in time for lunch, when the stalls and cafeteria had the freshest food. He'd be in trouble if the Holocloaks didn't find Bram's killer and were still out for blood, but he could deal with that on a full stomach. Take Bingo, for example. This guy's still talking. He likes to lead, as he's doing right now, taking charge at the front of the pack. But unfortunately for Bingo, he cannot manage people. There's a difference between leading and managing people? A kingdom of difference. You can bully and threaten, use your stature to put others down and create unquestioning subordinates. Good techniques for short-term obedience. But if you truly want to attract the loyal following, who will stay with you no matter what, then you first need to learn how to make people want to follow you. To manage them. And if you cannot manage people, then ultimately, you will lose the ability to tell them what to do. To lead them. Now, take Isaac. Who's Isaac? Bingo second in command. The man ahead to the right. Masif paused for a deep breath before continuing his speech. Isaac is better with people, and would be far more suited to being on the rung below Hilda Roth in the chain of command. Wouldn't that be a ladder of command? Masif continued, unfazed. But Isaac will never get that high, because his reputation has been totally eclipsed by the best fighter in the pits. Bingo. And so, the optimum system of management has forever been sealed off by this improvised hierarchy. Do you see what I'm saying? Masif turned his head and smirked, as if all this lecturing was supposed to be impressive. Fen shrugged. So what? That's just the way it is. Exactly, Fen! I wasn't trying to encourage you. Most people don't care. That's just the way it is. 
Take Tamar. Who's? The speechless killer, walking ahead with the white cloak. A quiet assassin with a suitably murderous reputation, yet possessing a rank barely above that of the hired muscle. Like most, she doesn't care enough to strive for anything more. Probably doesn't help that she never talks. Ah, you see? You do know who she is. For unlike the majority, you actually do care. No, I just guessed from the name. And it is men like you and me who do care that have to take action. Fen groaned. It's too early in the morning for this. The freelancers are breaking, Masif continued, spurred on by the sound of his own voice. The hollow cloaks and steel breakers, creavers and wielders, have all responded to Arminius's decline, not with the mourning spirit of a close-knit community, but rather with a cruel, self-serving malice. They no longer act as partners, but as competitors. Doesn't competition encourage the best results? Fenn asked, absent-mindedly picking at a loose thread on his jacket sleeve. Amongst rivals, yes, but against one's own family? It will only end in sorrow and tragedy. Even the gearheads have reacted poorly. I've been studying the clans and their chiefs. Key players, main dissidents, and the cogs in between. All from afar. A neutral position, if you will. Oh dear, you're one of those weird independent contractors. My neutrality gives me flexibility. Masif gave Fenn another self-satisfied smirk. It allows me to gain a new perspective. What an oddball. And a new vision. A soothsayer oddball. A vision of you and me ruling the freelancers together. Fenn drew his eyes from the approaching mass of skyscraper blocking the road to the smartly dressed man at his side. Ruling the freelancers? This man wasn't such an oddball after all. He was exactly like the clan chiefs. A heavenly valley sat before him, a softly glowing golden-white basin of serenity, a gorge sliced from honeyed clouds gifted upon the earth. It was inviting, that soft landscape where the distant birds tweeted and a gentle breeze tickled at his face. This light, what does it mean? It means we're outside. I'll readjust your eyes. Michael blinked, and with the rising of his eyelid, the real world crashed into view. The bleak, moss-crusted slope at his feet reappeared. The discoloured skyscraper sprang back into place, and heaps of abandoned traffic cooed along the misshapen roads. The sliver of cushioned relaxation had been replaced by the husk of discarded city Michael was all too familiar with. Only this time, something seemed a little different. The buildings in the distance to his right, across the grass-riddled square, were a little hazier, and the sky a lighter shade of grey. What changed? Everything looks... It's morning time. You were asleep for seventeen hours. Seventeen hours? He'd never slept so long in his life. Not even after arduous training weeks in the army. How did I sleep for seventeen hours? It would have been longer if I'd been given more time. More time to do what? The voice tossed the question aside like a used blaster cell. Move to that bush for cover. The voices are coming closer. Michael wondered what the voice had been doing to him as he slid down the black slope to the bushy shrub growing in a chink between two metal plates. Had he passed out, not because of some booby trap laying within the beast, but because the voice inside his head made him do so? How did it have such power over him? Michael knelt next to the shrub, struggling to get his bearings, both on the slope and in his own head. If he could still call it his head. Now, look to the road to your left. Not yet. He needed a minute to think. Michael rubbed his eyes. He didn't know what to do. Usually, he was calm in almost any situation. No matter how bad the odds, he always prided himself in keeping his cool. However... Right now, this was all too much. There must be some way to... 
What are you doing? I said, give me a minute. No, you didn't. Didn't I? Not out loud, you didn't. I can't hear what you're thinking. I thought you were inside my head. I'm using layman's terms for the sake of time. I'm not actually inside your head. I haven't integrated with any of your mental functions. I've only merged with your sensory receptors. My what? I can only read your five senses, not your thoughts. But how can you... Not now. Look to your left. Michael lifted his head and stared around the shrub's side to the massive street, blocked off further down by a felled skyscraper. As he looked, three figures appeared, climbing from the far side of the wrecked building and onto the top of the flat edge. Michael squinted, but still couldn't make out the details of a distant grip from the sky shining behind them. You were right, he whispered. Of course I'm right! The voice was far too loud for the quiet the situation demanded. I wouldn't have stopped my work to see off a pack of dogs. Now keep looking in their direction. I've got an eyeglass. I could... No need. The figures blew up, from small cutouts to looming giants. The land around them vanished as the three faces grew and expanded. The biggest of the three faces flicked its eyes towards Michael, its bulbous pupils looking straight into his. Michael yelped and tried to look away from the sudden nightmare. He averted his eyes and was met with smudgy grey, bleary black, indistinct brown. No more shapes, only blurs wherever he looked. He fell onto his back, scratched at his eyes in a panic, realised he couldn't see his hands. They were gone too, replaced by one uniform peachy colour. Calm down. Swift as a flicked switch, his fingers appeared in front of a leaden cloud canvas. Everything had morphed back into focus. I magnified your vision. I hoped you would study the enemy, not to lose your composure and... Would you stop messing with my eyes? Michael hissed. I don't know what you want, but I can't keep track of everything happening here. I told you, we have to see off the enemy. I'm still trying to work out who that enemy is. Fine. The voice paused leaving a space that Michael suspected would normally be filled with a sigh. I see rushing through this situation is only going to get us both killed, so let's take this slowly, shall we? Michael didn't say thanks. Wasn't sure he owed it. Now, can you please look at the skyscraper again? When you do, I'll extend your vision gradually this time. The voice had adopted the patronising tone you would use with a slow child, but it was better than the impatient shouting before. Michael resumed his position behind the shrub, rifle in hand, and gazed at the distant group. Again, at a creeping pace, the silhouettes grew, gaining in presence and size. The surrounding landscape dropped away, and whenever Michael flicked his gaze to the side, the world became one incomprehensible blur, like swivelling a specifically focused telescope to another area. He looked back to the grip. The largest man was a man with black skin and steely muscles straining under a tight camouflaged shirt. A brute with bullish eyes to match. A bald man accompanied him, bulging eyebrows shooting off to either side, and a cloaked figure in a remarkably clean white hood trailed behind. The two men were arguing with each other while the cloaked figure gazed ahead. Michael had a disturbing sensation it was directly towards him. I think they might have seen me earlier. If that was the case, they'd hardly be standing around shouting in the open. We need a plan. Michael felt himself grimace. I can handle that. Have you done this sort of thing before? So, the voice didn't know as much as it liked to pretend. A bit. And how would you approach this situation from tactical experience? Michael had already been thinking about it. He took out his compass, placed it on a nook in the shrub's branch, and examined the needle. They're coming from the west, the same direction as the fort. If they're with the same grip from last night, I mean, two nights ago, then they're not very organised. As he spoke, the large camo-shirted man gave the smaller one a shove, making him stumble dangerously close to the skyscraper's edge. The cloaked figure sidestepped the flailing man, paying little attention to the commotion. 
These men seem unruly in their approach, but I recollect that the group from the other night were drunk. You were... What was the right word? Awake for that? I've been conscious ever since you awoke from the tank. The entire time? Even when I've gone for a shit? Not that! The voice snapped with force, making Michael wince. I made sure to busy myself with other matters during those times. What other matters? Tasks more important than watching you chase rats in car parks like a buffoon. Hey! Watch out! More have arrived! Michael shifted his eyes, the smallest degree he could manage, still overshot by a considerable amount. He swabbled back to see new faces emerging over the skyscraper's ridge, recognised the closer, disgruntled face, saw the sweat trickling from the man's wrinkled brow, down his cheeks, and off the end of his white, pointed beard. Okay, Michael whispered. I've got a plan. Fenn struggled up the last block of concrete, awkwardly swinging his leg and scuffing it against the coarse edge. Another scrape to plaster over his protesting calves. He heaved himself upright atop the block, triumphant. His lungs immediately caught up with him to spoil the victory. He bent over, hands on knees, puffing for all he was worth. God's sake, why has no one built a staircase for this place? Ha! That would make it too easy. Coffee, like some accursed mountain goat, jumped from the last ledge and began stretching his legs. Why are you wearing gym gear? Fenn asked as Coffee removed his hooded jumper to reveal a neon yellow tank top. We're supposed to be on the hunt for a dangerous killer here. All the more important to be flexible. Coffee tossed as he ran towards Bingo, who was having a spat with his bald second in command. Fenn was glad he wasn't the only one pissing off the short-tempered giant. He hung back, staying well out of range of Bingo's outbursts. Massif, who he'd managed to lose in the climb, was right about one thing. Bingo was no people manager. The clamp hand climbed after Coffee, casually brushing down his too tight trousers as if he'd been out for nothing more than a slightly taxing stroll. Gods, maybe I should get fitter. Fenn clutched his side, whatever part got stitches, he'd forgotten the name, still aching away. Seems I should catch up on basic anatomy too. She always gives me a pause. The coat hanger hand talked most solemnly indeed. Fenn glanced in the direction he'd indicated, his least favourite part of the city, and it took some work to claim that title. The Spy Droid. He hated that monstrous hunk of metal, not only because it had once been one of the deadliest weapons to roam the planet, but also because it looked plain ugly, sitting there sprawled out across Central Square like some colossal bug squashed underfoot. The wreckage was notorious amongst the freelancers for causing strife between the clans over some nonsense about scrapping rights. Right then, only its partially buried head, glaring red eye and bulging neck were visible at the end of the road, the rest hidden around the end of the block. Unsightly, but nothing to give him a pause, whatever that meant. I wouldn't worry about, uh, her. The thing's long dead. Not the droid. The one hand tutted and nodded his head. Her. The speechless killer. Fenn looked again, this time at the cloaked figure standing at the far edge of the skyscraper. Oh, isn't that the woman who rarely speaks a word? Not rarely. The blunt hand dropped his voice to a whisper, despite the hooded woman being well out of earshot. She never speaks a word. I've asked around, but no one has heard her utter a single syllable. It's like she's cursed. Or has a sore throat. What happens when you try talking to her? Fenn asked at normal volume, making the trident hand wince. I've tried that, he whispered even lower but all I get is a nod, a shake of the head, or worse. Worse? The deadly hand nodded, a grim look painted on his scarred face. It's her smile. Her what? Her smile. It's always a smile with her. I'd rather have a woman constantly frown at me than do that. It puts me on edge, like she's got some evil thoughts. 
Your friend with the blaster launcher probably has much more dastardly intentions, Fenn said as the shaved woman came up the rise, blaster launcher protruding like a murderous chimney. You know, they say Tamar also smiles when she kills, and it always seems to be my direction in particular she's smiling. See what I'm saying? Wait, Tamar? How do you know her name if she can't speak? The wonky hand looked at Fenn from behind his sunglasses, as if he'd just asked why the sky wasn't made of rice. You do know she can still write. So why don't you get her to write down the answers to any of these mad questions? Fenn placed a consoling hand on the vice hand's shoulder, like gripping a flank of tough meat. Let me tell you. What's your name again? Of a broken hand. I'm in your proper name. Fenn dropped his hand, the gesture making him feel silly. None of that gimmicky nonsense. The man's mouth formed a suspicious line. Wit. Well, let me tell you, wit. I'd drop her from your mind. Don't let your paranoia drive you into becoming a wreck. If you start worrying about people who smile at you, then what are you going to think of the ones who don't? Speaking of... Fenn trailed off as Bingo stomped over to their side of the building. Where's my safe? He demanded, eyes caught between a mad bulge and a narrowing glare. I don't know. Managed to get rid of him when we started climbing. Get rid of him? He's controlling the drone! Why am I the one getting shouted at for it? The drone's not working. Masif had pulled another magical teleporting act directly behind Fen, making him jump. I'm afraid the drone was taken out. Taken out? Bingo seemed unable to comprehend the words. It seems a sea eagle took the drone for a rival invading its territory. It attacked, most unfortunately causing the drone to crash. So now the freelancers have angry birds to add to its growing list of enemies. We should head back. It's too risky to patrol ahead without the drone. Bingo second in command, a man with eyebrows out to make a fashion statement, had spoken up. The party of eight fell silent, letting the sound of a whistling breeze fill the air. We don't go back, Bingo replied, ice in his words. Not before the other patrols. It's too risky. Eyebrows wasn't backing down. We can't see what lies ahead or above. I'm as sceptical of the old man's story as anyone else. Old man? But if he's telling the truth then this attacker could be laying a trap ahead for us to walk straight into. A few of the party were exchanging agreeing looks, but Bingo wasn't having any of it. He stepped forward, slowly, his chest leading the charge. He walked up to eyebrows, all the way, and made the considerably smaller man take a few steps back. We. Go. On. Eyebrows glanced around, saw no help coming from the rest of the group. He averted his eyes. Braun had won the day. Bingo turned, and wordlessly, everyone followed. Eyebrows stayed at the back of the group, and Coffee no longer laughed. Even Massif had abandoned his ranting. The atmosphere soured in an instant. Bingo didn't seem to care. He turned on his heel as the silent procession reached the edge of the descent, scraping loose rubble over the side. Fen, you lead the way. Me? But I... Not another word. Bingo's expression dared him to argue. Fen stared back at the group, mirroring Eyebrow's desperate plea for help from moments ago. At Coffee, flanked on either side by Tonkai's stone-faced hands at eyebrows sullenly staring at the ground, at Massif picking something from his teeth, and at the white-cloaked woman, outlines of a smile barely visible under her hood. No help whatsoever. Fenn turned and trudged past Bingo, who at least had the courtesy to step aside for him, to the skyscraper's edge. They'd reached the metal girder in the corner sticking up at a 90 degree angle, which marked the rough path of steep debris stomped solid over years of patrols descending the rubble crevasse. The loose stones and glass tended to crumble and shift with each storm, and it was customary for the fittest member of each patrol to find and lead the way down the easiest route. Or, Fen reflected, the least popular. 
Don't worry, Fen. It wasn't Bingo following directly behind with comforting words, but Massif instead. I'll keep you company. Wonderful. A cold breeze blew along the shafts of skyscraper innards, forming their path, making Fen glance up at the hulking spidroid rising against the brightening afternoon sky as they sank downwards. I'll keep you company. There was only one thing he had the energy to curse. Michael adjusted the rifle, barrel resting on top of a branch near the shrub's trunk where it was strong enough to hold the gun's weight. Lined his eye along the iron sights, gouged out of the BR-16's curved top guard, like looking down a straight-edged valley of metal. Even if it possessed a scope, he wouldn't have needed it. His eyes were already surveying the far end of the road in near perfect detail. A definite upgrade from the eyeglass in his pocket. Another tool for him to carry out his mission. No longer was he in charge of the events about to... What's your plan? Shoot and let them come to me. And then the struggle would begin. The thin line between life and death, ever strained, would be pulled taut, snapping for some as both sides pulled even. And after that? What? Michael asked, annoyed at the voice flickering back into his thoughts. And what will you do once they come for you? I'll kill them. That's it? That's your plan? Yes. After that, fate will decide. Who? It's not a person. It's whatever has allowed me to keep surviving all these years. You can't be serious. The voice was becoming strained, increasing in pitch. Are you nervous? Michael asked, amused at the irritable voices panicking. You're not! Why should I be? I'll either win or lose. Doesn't get simpler than that. This must be some sort of joke. You're going to get us killed. Shush, you're too loud. You're the only one who can hear me. Still, I need quiet to concentrate. On what? Clearly complex thinking isn't your forte. I don't have time to worry about forts. Right now, I need to decide who to shoot first. I'll only be able to get a good few shots in before the rest run to cover. The first members of the group, eight in total, had reached the bottom of the skyscraper and were now emerging from a collapsed subway into the daylight. That was fine. A BR-16 magazine held twelve cells. Easy. Shoot the big one. Michael ran his eye up and down the large, black-skinned man, free from the front. No, he'll be an easy target, even on the move. I'm going to aim for him. Michael shifted his eye to the leader of the pack. He felt no twinge of guilt in taking out the bandits. These trespassers had taken the Alliance's home for themselves. Someone had to put things right. Why do I recognise him? He was there the other night. One of that night's drunken escapade, and I suppose picking off the weakest first is always a winning. The voice halted its sarcastic reply. Hello? Did you lose connection with my head or something? I do recognize him. He saw... Saw what? You should kill him. He's seen you up close. We can't allow him to identify you later in case you try infiltrating their numbers. Michael was impressed. Now you're thinking the right way. He continued to stare at the leader and the shirted man walking next to him, adjusted his rifle by the tiniest of millimetres against the scratching bark. I always think the right way. Under our guidance, the fort can become an organised, professional force. We already are professional, Fen snapped at Massif. He was in an even fouler mood after descending the toppled skyscraper, bruising himself more times than a poorly picked apple orchard. Anyone who gets paid for their work is professional. We are only such in definition. In practice, we are nothing more than amateurs. Massif seemed to have a quick response for anything Fenn said. It was exhausting arguing with him. The sound of crashing, echoing metal made Fenn spin around to his right juggling the rifle off his back. He relaxed when he saw the white-cloaked woman, Tamar, run by on top of an overturned truck. 
he decided to keep his rifle held in front of him. Where's she running off to? Masif paused his soapboxing to glance over. Tamar has always been an eccentric character. Look who's talking. Masif grinned. Brilliance is often confused for madness. Try saying that to Arminius. Ah, now, it is important not to confuse the matter. Masif spread his arms wide. For it takes a special kind of madness to... The beeping on Masif's smart gauntlet interrupted him. Thank the gods. Masif opened his gauntlet as they walked under a sagging tree. The drooping, lobed orange leaves were being whipped by the strengthening wind, creating a ghostly whooshing sound, unnatural among the abandoned man-made mess. Fenn heard the others behind him complaining about the weather. He'd be happy as long as it didn't rain. Masif stopped, so suddenly that Fenn paused and looked back at the man's abrupt change of pace. What's got you worried? Masif looked up from his gauntlet with wide, staring eyes. Tamar just messaged me. The enemy's ahead. I don't see any... A flash of black popped in front of Fenn. Something hard hit his eyes, and his vision went dark as the sound of a blaster shot smacked his ears. Fenn and Masif were down. He hadn't seen how. Only the black flash of a blaster shot and the pair of men leading the patrol dive for cover. Or collapse into it. Wit poked his eyes above the loader's engine to survey the damage. The distant attacker was firing from a bush sprouting atop the spy droid's head. Black blasts zipped down, pelting the spot where Fen and Masif sheltered behind the thick trunk of their own tree, flakes of bark scrambling from the blaster shot's bite. The assailant was confident with a rifle, firing with such precision from so far away. Probably had a scope attached. Maybe a stand as well. How were they supposed to take that position? Hopefully someone else would lead the charge. Then again, Strong would probably make him run first alongside her. Shit. It wasn't meant to go this way. Tonkai said there'd be no trouble. All they had to do was keep an eye on the old, bearded man. But here he was in a fresh battle. Again. Can you let go of my- Ow! I mean, I appreciate it. But it's getting quite painful. Wit looked to Coffee. The free prongs of his clamp were holding tight to the man's bare arm. He had instinctively grabbed and pulled him to a crouching position behind the old construction vehicle as soon as the blaster shot song filled the street. He was gripping too hard. Even after all these years, the damn clamp was still impossible to control. Sorry, said Wit, releasing Coffee's arm. Coffee rubbed it and gave him a pained smile. No problem. It's a good excuse to stop lifting weights for a while. Joking around while being shot at? Wit was amazed at the man's nerve. Another noise began to fill the air, like that of a blaster shot with more oomph, a deep ripping that sent vibrations through Wit's chest. He recognised the dreaded sound, and sure enough, when he turned, he saw the red. The bolts of a fusion weapon fired towards the spy droid's head, forcing the distant outline of the attacker to scramble further up the slope. Bingo. He ran ahead, shooting at the attacker with a fusion submachine gun. His accuracy wasn't great, but the rapid succession of blaring red bolts drove the enemy back. Come on, said Coffee, pivoting around the loader. We can get to Fen. Here he was, watching the fighting while someone else took the initiative. Had he been getting worse at this? Then again, this was exactly why he'd quit being a frontliner. Wit cursed and picked up his gun. Scurried after coffee down a chasm blasted into the road from a long distant battle. Seemed new scars would be carved into its face today. Hoped the same wouldn't be said for him. Wit copied Coffee's slightly crouched position as he ran, although the man in front was probably finding the awkward dash much easier in sweatpants and trainers. Wit's trousers had shrunk in the wash, clinging uncomfortably to his legs. The sounds of the screaming fusion gun and booming blaster rifle echoed in Wit's ears, but he dared not look up from Coffee sweating back. Knew it would only want to make him run in the opposite direction. 
They hopped a street sign, bent sideways, and landed in a patch of glistening tarmac guarded by the large tree. Half of the tree's thinly buried roots bulged against the tarmac, creating a bumpy web across the clearing that copied the branches in the canopy above. Only one of the men had opted for cover behind its trunk. The other lay among the tarmac-crusted roots, head completely removed. His face must have been hit dead centre by the first blaster shot. The floor was covered in sprinkles of skull and brain, scattered amongst the red-stained autumn leaves. It was the kind of sight that reminded Wit why he was so anxious to avoid firefights. The other man lay pressed against one of the tree's gnarled roots, clutching his blood-drenched head. Medic! I need a doctor, or a med pack at the very least! Coffee knelt next to the man and glanced over at Wit. Do you have anything? Shit. Had to forget his medical kit. Strong always carried that kind of thing, but Wit had no idea where she was. Everyone had split as soon as the shooting started. He unstrapped his backpack and clumsily groped through its contents with his poor excuse of a hand. Here. Wit tossed the water bottle. Coffee snatched it from the air and unplugged the cap, poured it onto the man's face. The blood came off in a thin stream, leaving behind reddish-black clumps in his pointed goatee. Wit glanced back at the fancy shirt sprawled limp across the ground. Looked like the famously talkative Massif would finally be quiet. Gods, I'm not getting back to the tavern, am I? Finn! cried Coffee, grabbing the man's dirty head in both hands. What's wrong? I don't see anything. You can't! Fenn gulped a few desperate heaps of air, eyes glazed and distant. Gods, you must be more blind than me! Wit stooped next to Coffee and examined Fenn's face. You're fine. How can you say that? I don't look fine at all. Don't worry, that's normal, Coffee said, winking at Wit. Bastards, all of you, joking around while I slowly... What's the problem? interrupted Wit. My eye! I've been hit in my eye! I've only got moments left, I tell you! Coffee leant in and began prodding his fingers into Fenn's eyes. What are you doing, you fiend? You'll be the death of me! Here we are, announced Coffee, holding up his index finger. Wit had to squint to see the tiny white fragment sitting there. What is it? Piece of bone, I think. Coffee nodded towards Massif's corpse. From our friend. Fenn sat up, blinking the blood from his eyes. He glanced from the upheld finger to Coffee, then wit. Oh, I guess that was it. He scratched at his cheek and grimaced. Sorry for calling you bastards and all that. What an idiot. Wit didn't lose his cool in the heat of battle. At least... Not over a splinter in the eye. Is everyone all right? Oh, fuck. Not even Isaac's abnormally large eyebrows could hide the shock underneath them as he emerged from the chasm. That's it. I'm calling in reinforcements. There you are. Strong had followed Isaac to the impromptu meeting. Wit didn't know whether to be relieved or scared about reuniting with his shaven companion. Strong calmly surveyed Massif's corpse as she swapped his blaster rifle for her launcher, dumping the weapon on the ground with a thud. Look after the launcher. It's too heavy to run uphill with. Aren't you going to take cover? Coffee asked. She shook her head. Bengo's got the gunner distracted. We need to join him. She directed her last comment at wit. Exactly what he'd been afraid of. And no way could he say no. He was too much of a coward for that. Isaac was on his smart gauntlet, pleading for help from the other party leaders, while Coffey tended to Fenn's shell shock, although it hadn't been much of a shelling to put him in that state. So it was just him and Strong going on the offensive. Shit. This better not cost him another hand. With barely a look of acknowledgement, Strong led the way, rounding the tree's foliage to the all-too-open road. Bingo stood a few metres ahead, using a decaying, waist-high taxi for scant cover. Wit might have been able to hear Bingo screaming, if not for the tremendous noise of the fusion bolts, the bright red painful to look at. 
He was still firing towards the spy droid, dominating the space between the street and central square. Strong shouted something, incoherent under the screeching bolts. Bengal cracked his head towards them, eyes round and crazed. When he got that look in the fighting pits, Wit and at least two other men had to restrain him before he killed his opponent. Berserk Bingo had appeared. Let's go rip that fucker apart, he shouted, flicking saliva at Wit and Strong. Wit had to use a full dose of willpower not to turn heel and escape the mad beast's eye. Were they really supposed to follow Berserk Bingo's orders? Lead the way. Strong had made the decision for him. Again. A blaster shot slammed into the taxi, making the metal howl and screech. Bingo turned and roared, firing another salvo up the slope. The fusion gun, magazine sticking out horizontally from its side, jumped and bounced in protest as it spat more bolts in a wide spray. Bingo's rage must have numbed his pain. His grip stayed firm on the weapon, whose whole perforated barrel shimmered and hissed with heat. Bingo gave another roar, and in one great bound, jumped atop the taxi, rust raining from its roof, and down the other side. Strong followed immediately, no hesitation in her steps. Hard to tell if it was out of loyalty for Bingo, or a shared thirst for blood. They were actually doing this. Should he ask Strong if this was the best idea? Never mind. They both knew who made the decisions in this partnership. Wit doggedly ran after the pair, hoping against hope and all its buddies that Bingo and Strong would suddenly realise how ridiculous this was and turn back. Maybe the attacker would surrender for lack of ammunition, or Wit could get a sprained ankle, fall behind, and regretfully tell his comrades to go on without him. Grim times indeed, when the outcome you're hoping for involves broken body parts. Bingo yelled and fired another fusion bolt as he ran. Strong copied with a black blaster shot from her own rifle. Wit didn't bother. His conventional assault rifle was laughably weak next to the thundering energy weapons. The crunching tarmac and gravel turned to echoey poundings as Wit crossed onto the black metal of the spy droid, desperately trying to catch up to his two companions. Could use their large backs to hide from the attacker's line of sight. The slope steepened, and Wit felt the familiar burnings in his hamstrings as they climbed. Maybe he'd skip his next leg day at the gym. Then again, climbing a slippery slope for a few minutes was hardly the same as intensive weight exercises, and... Stop it! Concentrate on the battle! Why had it become so quiet? Slapping footsteps and heavy breaths were the only sounds filling the eerie silence. They reached the bush the attacker had been shooting from, spent blaster cells littering the moss around its base. Past it. Bengos and Strong's breathing became laboured as they focused their efforts on climbing the sleek, slippery surface, grabbing foliage to pull themselves up. Both had stopped firing. And no one covered them. Wet paused, looked ahead at the steep rise where the slope of the spy droid's head ended and the rest of its body loomed above. A dark cliff beyond the lip. The outline of a circular-shaped silhouette poked out between the two. The attacker, he was standing on the neck, must have finally reloaded his gun, because he was taking aim. Shit. Wit lifted his rifle. Too late. The man fired, and the blaster shot shrieked down, hitting strong. She returned a scream of her own. Wit shot back, sending a clatter of bullets at the attacker. He heard them ricochet against the metal, but the man had already dropped behind cover. You fucking maggot! Bingo fired at the ledge, lighting it in crimson firework reflections. The lights only seemed to make him angrier. He yelled again and rushed upwards, shooting as he ran. Wit let him run on. He was dumb with chasing after the crazed bull. He hurried to Strong, knelt next to her, clutching onto a clump of moss and weeds for support next to a precarious hole in the metal. Strong's eyes were screwed tight, her teeth bared. She was on her knees, next to the crisp remains of her left arm. The blast had struck just below the elbow. 
seemed Wit was no longer the only one-handed member of their duo. Fortunately, the hit had been clean, the passing heat of the blaster shot great enough to sear the rest of Strong's arm shut. Couldn't take it for granted, though. He'd seen instant blaster cauterizations like this one soon erupt, the pressure of the blood behind the thin layer of burnt flesh forcing its way through like a burst sewer pipe. Come on, Strong, said Wit, reaching for her one remaining arm. Let's go back. Strong slapped the proffered clamp away. Get off me, Broken! We're not going back until the job's done! But you just lost an arm! Strong glared at her new stump like she would an insulting drunk at the fort. Didn't stop you from fighting? No, but it had made him rightfully terrified of it. Couldn't admit that to the woman refusing to take any life lessons from her lost limb. He knew she was headstrong, but this was on another level. Must be anvil-headed thinking. Come on, you can't fight with one arm. Watch me. Strong slowly rose to her feet, letting her rifle dangle by its strap. She pulled her blaster rifle from its holster and held it aloft, snarl resting below a set of crazed eyes identical to berserk bingos. These people, every one of them. Why had it taken Wet so long to realise? He'd surrounded himself with insanity. Bingo bounded up the last few metres of the spy droid's head, reaching its neck. Shouted an unadulterated anthem of rage when he saw his prey had already retreated. He looked around him before spying the cracked hole in the droid's armour. He yelled again and charged inside. That boy always had been quick to anger. Didn't he realise he'd get himself hurt running around like that? With the shooting over, everything had settled. The breeze's gentle whistle blew along the street once more, minus the calls of the birds and dogs, which had all fled from the racket of the men's toys. Tamar scratched at her itchy ear under the white cotton hood. Usually, she only wore the hood to conceal her face on foreign missions, but this morning proved to be terribly cold, and the full-length white cloak was the thickest she owned. This far up, it was especially chilly, the biting wind making the ends of her cloak play and snap with the knee-length boots underneath. Tamar nudged the folded gun further into the small of her back, carefully hiding it under both cloak and top. Best if the boys don't see it and become overexcited. She was glad to have made the climb, hopping from broken door frames and the tops of walls and wooden shafts in a ragged ascent that led to a balcony, partway up the skyscraper, cornering the end of the road. The spot provided excellent views of the downed spy droid's upper half, where the attacker had taken cover behind an intruding hazel shrub. Tamar had run ahead of the others and spotted the man hiding in the leaves, up to no good. She'd sent a warning message to Massif, but the cheeky thing had been too quick, firing at a very impressive distance. Poor Massif. She could see his body in the clearing by the oak tree plucked of most of its deciduous leaves, where the other three boys were still taking cover. Tamar ran her eye from the clearing to the spy droid, where no doubt Bingo was running amuck inside with the killer. She had no desire to go in after them. Well-lit, open spaces were much more enjoyable than dark, cramped mazes filled with angry men storming all over the place. She looked back to the spy droid's head and spotted Tonkai's hands arguing next to a large hole cratered into the metal. What horrible names. It suited the strong hand, that large, brutish woman with no manners or fashion sense, but it certainly didn't fit the broken hand. Poor wit being called something so ugly. Tamar felt her smile widen and her cheeks lift as her eyes settled on him. What a lovely young specimen. Wit had a rough exterior, although she knew how kind and considerate he was despite appearances. He'd caught her eye a few months ago, and Tamar would be lying if she said she wasn't looking forward to their encounters. Not that she could say so anyway. Plus, what a great body. She appreciated someone who took care of themselves. 
He was too far at the moment, but Tamar had already noticed the particularly tight pair of trousers Wit wore today. She'd make sure to get a peek at his lovely bum later. Smiling, she tilted her head back to the spy droid's improvised entrance. Wit had scared her half to death earlier, recklessly running towards the attacker like that. She would move closer to the battlefield. Then, if that man came back out, she could dispose of him quickly. Didn't want to risk anything happening to her one-armed stallion. You've backed yourself into quite the corner. Quiet, Michael whispered. Why? Do I have to keep reminding you that you're the only one who can- I can't hear him while you're talking, Michael hissed. He edged further down the corridor, straining his ears for any sudden sounds. Any sound at all that interrupted the stifling silence. Had he been followed? Surely there should be some noise coming from that mountain of a man. He'd shown no signs of slowing while shooting round after round of those strange projectiles. The red energy possessed a strength similar to that of blaster shots, strong enough to toast and fling pieces of boiling metal from Michael's cover, burning themselves into his arms and face. Ah! Steam started to rise from the metallic burn marks. That hurts, you know. Of course it does. I'm stitching and rebuilding cell tissue, not slapping a plaster on a scratch. If you can heal me anyway, then why don't we take this guy head on? I caution you not to take this ability of mine lightly. Every time I carry out this process, I use a substantial amount of your stored energy, and you are already running low. If you were to be as foolhardy as you were the other night, and get directly shot by that man's weapon, then it's uncertain whether you have enough reserves for me to revive you. If I don't have that much energy left, then why are you focusing on tiny burns? The voice hesitated. I'll decide what gets prioritized here. Michael stopped at a junction and scrutinized the corridors, each with identical metal walls and unlit strips of light in the ceilings. At least he could see in what would have otherwise been utter darkness. Hey, um, Flicker? Michael said the first name that had come to mind. It was distracting thinking back to the voice without any label for it. Are you talking to me? What was that name? If you could hear those men approaching earlier, why can't you alter my ears now? Why did you call me that? We don't have time for that now, Michael said, mimicking Flicker's earlier words. Flicker paused, then, deliberately slow, replied. It took me two days just to figure out how to adjust your eyes. You saw for yourself, in the full sense of the word, how incomplete my preparations were for your input. It will take at least that amount of time, if not more, to fine-tune another sensory function. A loud crash rang through the air, accompanied by the yelling of a very angry man. Come out of hiding, you bastard of a whore! I'll gut your belly like you did to my man! They were hunting him to avenge the man whose throat he'd slit, and with serious backup. He'd counted eight bandits outside. One was down, and the other injured, but there might be more on the way. You should have killed the one with the goatee. Michael could explain how he'd been trying to do just that. How the BR-16 wasn't ideal for long-range accuracy, and that he'd had no opportunity for a test shot against the interfering wind. But those were excuses. He didn't like excuses. Instead, he simply said, I'll get him next time. Another crash made Michael glance back as he ran. This metal labyrinth and his own footsteps within it were making it impossible to pinpoint the enemy. Signs flashed by. No time to read them. He would have to solve the mystery behind this lair another time. Things weren't going to plan. Not that there had been much of one to begin with. He was just following his gut and his gut told him to get away from the runaway cavalry of a man who'd been undaunted by the hail of blaster shots. He'd turned out to be a lot bigger up close, and that mysterious red weapon gave Michael little comfort. He'd need to properly scout out the enemy before he engaged. Why don't you retreat? Michael glanced down the next set of corridors, dashed along the one lined with a length of snaking pipes. I am... I mean retreat from the battle. 
You've got nothing to gain from killing this man. It's not about what I have to gain. It's about doing what's right. How is this right? Michael stopped in his tracks. Didn't you hear what they were talking about the other night? They've been eating people. Yes, I did, and I have to ask, did the possibility of sarcasm ever occur to you? Sarcasm? Yes, it's what's also known as humour. Jokes? Michael asked, raising his voice. Who would joke about that? And who would kill over it? I stopped a bandit in his tracks. There was no... A pop of light from the far end of the corridor. The pinpoint burst into an explosion of excruciating brightness. Michael shut his eyelids, too late to escape the afterimage scorched into his retinas. He turned, stumbling back the way he'd came, as a high-pitched roar filled the corridor. Something seared the edge of his left arm, and he smelt his flesh cooking as the skin blistered and crackled. The hairs on his arm were burnt down to their roots, jacket on top sizzled in an instant, as the superheated energy hissed by. He rounded a corner and sprinted, as hard as he could, hands stretched out in front to fumble ahead. He bit his lip and clenched his fist around the blaster rifle as Flicker began healing his arm and eyes. He must have heard you talking. Waited until he was in close proximity. Switched on a flashlight. Flicker rattled out the broken sentences, voice shaking. I wasn't able to adjust your eyes in time for normal light levels. I'm... He didn't finish the sentence. Michael blinked the tears and steam from his eyes, legs lagging, as yet another adrenaline boost left his system. Maybe retreating wasn't such a bad idea. The clouds had started to clear, allowing glimpses of white sky to poke through. The extra light wasn't harsh, but Wit was glad to have his sunglasses. They covered his wincing, oversensitive eyes. He surveyed the polarised landscape, metal dropping away on either side of their position on the slope, gnarled ribs of city wreckage lurking from the left, empty slab of central square flanking the right. He's still inside the droid. Both of them are. No one's come out. Good. Strong was talking to Tonkai, using Wet's gauntlet. Her own had been destroyed alongside her left arm. The way she'd got on with her day as if nothing happened was beyond him. Clearly, Strong was named as such for more than just physical ability. Must be the same reason he'd been labelled with broken. When Wit lost his hand, he had blubbered and cried for the first few days. After that, he became reflective, pondering existence for weeks, and in the following months, he'd switched again to become disheartened at the unfairness of life had a feeling he was still wrapped in those final phases, but after a while, it's hard to remember what you were like before. Always easier to see how people around you change, rather than yourself. At least he had convinced Strong to contact the boss before running off on another suicide mission, and for once, he'd made the right call. I can catch the fucker if you let me. Don't try it, came Tonkai's rough voice on the gauntlet. Wait for me to arrive. We're very close. Was he genuinely concerned about Strong? Or was he after a personal stake in the killing glory? Hard to tell with Tonkai. Sure enough, the northern party began to emerge from a street further up the grid. A thin line of men and women dividing the tall city blocks from the vast open square to their left. No cars with fair patrol either. This was a hard part of the city to reach every road clogged with the abandoned remains of civilization, like cholesterol-stuffed arteries. Maybe if they cleaned up the place a little, it wouldn't be so hard to find one man. Looks like Fenn was telling the truth about this killer, shouted Wit to Strong, who still held his gauntlet open in one hand. She scowled at him, and Wit was sure Tonkai did the same on his end. Where is that fool? Back in the street, said Strong. Crying with the other cowards. Broken! Go fetch that shirker and drag him up there if you have to. He's not getting out of work that easy. Seemed his boss had found yet another person to take a disliking to. Tonkai hung up without another word. Could have at least said bye. 
Strong was a few metres away, so she tossed the gauntlet to wit, and he awkwardly grasped it from the air with both hand and clamp. He slid the gauntlet past the metal prongs and clasped it shut on his forearm. At least he hadn't lost everything under the elbow like Strong, although it didn't seem she cared much. No point in consoling this particular woman. I'll head back down and get Fen, Wit said, eager to get away, even temporarily, from the new battle lines being drawn. Strong opened her mouth to reply, stopped mid-utterance. She reached for her rifle, forgetting she only had one hand, elbow swinging uselessly. Wit didn't stop to sympathise. He quickly turned and looked up the sloop, trying to match Strong's eyeline and see the commotion. Had the attacker come back? He tilted his head to the tropical sky, sunglasses doing little to stop it turning a brighter and brighter blue. Tropical? Not dreary and grey, but splendid sparkling azure, just like the colour of... Shit. The blast whooshed to his left and hit exactly where Strong was standing. The explosion pressed on his ears, threatening to burst his drums. Flesh, debris, and molten metal flew as the force banged against Wit's chest. He was tossed over the side, like a piece of leftover dinner flung through the window. A shot from a blaster rifle tore a man apart, a force so intimately powerful that it destroyed whatever part it hit, so Fenn wasn't entirely sure how to compare the impact of a blaster turret. Did it eviscerate whoever it hit, grinding them into tiny fragments and throwing away the evidence in every direction, not a scrap left behind? No matter the details, the fact was, the strong hand had been standing there one moment, gone the next. All that remained was a smouldering crater in the metal, chunks still sprinkling down with little taps and a layer of fine pink mist, unsure of what to do with itself, floating where the woman had stood. Fen hadn't seen what happened to her clamp-armed partner. Vanished too in the flash of blue light. Eyebrows had stopped the frantic chattering into his gauntlet to gape at the explosion, as sudden as a lightning strike on a clear day. Now he talked faster than ever, telling every fighter available to come at once. Fen could see the other party joining them from the far side of the spy droid. Another eight-person rabble. Nowhere near enough. What was that? Coffee asked, squinting at the glowing blob in the sky. A gunship, Fen replied, struggling to think of a worse time for this encounter especially considering he was on the wrong side of the fort walls so very far away. It's the Alliance. Tonkai's approaching patrol had started firing sporadic black blaster shots at the gunship, which was a very good thing. They were drawing its attention from Fen and his brave companions cowering underneath their tree. Alliance? Coffee asked. What are they doing here? Fen, still shaken from his lover close brush with death, took a second to answer. He stroked his beard in contemplation, pulled his fingers away to find them covered in dry, flaky blood. A near brush with death indeed. One that's left me quite filthy. It looked like he'd be having a few more before the day was out. No idea, but at least it answers the question of who killed last week's patrol. Maybe they're connected with the mud demon. Gods, he needed a drink, but Bingo had already confiscated his hip flask that morning. Truly dire times. The gunship fired free blasts from its forward turret, the resulting explosions reverberating through the air as they hit the street hidden around the corner. Fortunately, there was no intact glass left on the roads to be shattered by the force of the monstrous turret. The gunship really did pack a punch. It had stopped descending and was currently hovering above the spy droid's head, laying claim to the slope from where it had swatted away Tonkai's hands. It was a very sleek-looking ship, a new model perhaps, which would make sense since Fen hadn't seen one in official use for years. The ones he was used to were older, more abandoned, or a tad stolen. This gunship wasn't drastically different from its ancestors, 
It still had that thin body, with an angled cockpit, ending in a pointed nose, where a pesky rotatable blaster turret hung beneath. The two main wings, folded back during high-speed flights, had extended out to either side so it could hover, extra rectangular engines dropping from the ends to stabilise and assist the small jets of fire spurting from the main body. The main engine sat beneath a second set of smaller wings, tipped above the tail at the back, and was creating one hell of a roar to complement the turret's bangs. You'd think the Alliance designed their gunships for a fashion show rather than a war. Everything looked so damn fancy and modern. At least they'd taken the camo job a little more seriously, painting the ship in a soft matte grey to match the urban environment, finished off with sky blue trimmings. Or was that meant to be Alliance Blue? The pilot wasn't going all out in his murdering. Fenn knew from past experience, and not the pleasant kind, that the extended wings could drop down an extra blaster turret each, but the compartments were staying mercifully closed. Three turrets would have been excessive in dealing with such a motley crew. The freelancer reinforcements were mustering a feeble defence, most of their blaster fire missing the ship. The few shots that did hit bashed the gunship in brief black bursts, failing to do more than scorch and scratch the armour. It would take a mountain load of those to bring down that flying tank. What are we going to do? Coffee asked. Tonkai will know. Eyebrows had finished his bleating for backup. We need to join his party. Fen had no intention of attending any party being thrown by Tonkai, especially one with hostile turret fire in attendance. I'm not going over there. Our closest gunship is near Shankmora. That's hours away. We have to do something to stop that thing until they get here. And stop them as well. The ship slid open one of its side doors, allowing a string of soldiers to rappel onto the spy droid's head. Fenn didn't know what was more disconcerting, the brand new blaster rifles the soldiers were carrying, or their full sets of armour, with helmets too, equipped for action against a proper fighting force instead of a lightly clothed grip of ill-trained mercenaries. Fenn scanned the clearing, looking for the easiest exit spotted the strong woman's trinket from the start of the day, abandoned in the muck. She wouldn't be needing it now. A plan popped into Fenn's head. Not as good a plan as running away, but he was already in uncomfortably hot water at the fort as was, and that water would be heated to boiling point if he was found snoozing in one of the tavern sofas whilst the Alliance made such a farcus on the doorstep. Fenn awkwardly crouch-walked over to the device, cursing his back, and attempted a lift. He barely got halfway off the ground before he swore and let the metal monster drop. Started cursing his flimsy arms too. Coffee! Come help me lift this launcher! Fenn shouted. He immediately swore at himself for yelling his surprise plan for all the Alliance to hear. Thankfully, the never-ending noise of blaster fire provided an excellent cover for his blunders. Coffee jogged over to Fenn, revealing his head and shoulders to the Alliance forces. It would be a miracle if this plan went unnoticed. Coffee knelt, wrapped his hands under the upper barrel of the launcher, and together they managed to heave the weapon into the air. Fenn teetered a bit before resting it on his shoulder, twisting the weapon so the handle stopped digging into his back. Fenn started to lead Coffee, launcher pointed backwards, in the opposite direction of the fighting. Good idea. Where are you going? Eyebrows asked. At least Coffee was happy enough to get tugged along without questioning jabbers. If you're thinking of running, then you better. I would never run away, Fenn shouted back over his unloaded shoulder. He swore again and lowered his voice. I have a reputation to uphold. Then where are you going? Up there. Fenn was already losing his breath. I saw the white-cloaked lady on a balcony earlier. The speechless killer, Coffee added. That's the one. Miss Keller's gone now, but I reckon it can't be too hard to get up there. What about Tonkai's orders to join him? Fenn rolled his eyes at eyebrows weaker than wet noodles counter-argument. You're welcome to join him, Fenn replied as they began to edge along a lane of trucks and buses. But right now, I'm carrying the launcher, so I'll call the shots. Good one, Coffee called. Did I make a joke? 
Another explosion boomed down the street, followed by the crashing of debris and a scream. That helped Eyebrows make his decision. Fine, he said, falling in line with the launcher. We'll come with you if you insist. I didn't. Fenn slipped on a loose piece of stone hiding amongst the mud, and yelped as he juggled with the launcher. Careful with that trigger, Coffee said, or else this party is really going to go off. What is he on about? Hey, can't call him Eyebrows. You at the back, come here. Eyebrows scampered over. What is it? Stand straight. There we go. Fenn heaved the launcher off his shoulders and onto Eyebrows' considerably more capable ones. Thanks. My back's killing me. Come out, come out, little mouse. The large man's words rang through the corridors, clapping off walls and ringing from metal. The pursuer had become impatient with creeping around in the dark, and had started taunting, trying to goad his prey towards him. Thing was, Michael felt it working. He didn't like running from a fight, not if the only skin he was saving was his own. All I've seen so far is your back. Let me see your front, so I can see how yellow it really is. Michael gritted his teeth. Does he really think that will work? How about we throw down our weapons and fight like men? As if we would really... Michael stopped running, turned on his heel, and shouted. How about we do just that? A shock jabbed Michael's front like an electric rod. Run, you imbecile! Flicker hissed. Michael grunted and turned back down the hallway. Laughter clasped at the pounding slaps of Michael's feet. That's the spirit. You wait. I'm going to tear you apart for what you did to Bram. Why should we run from this guy? Michael asked. I can take him. You don't know that for certain. Well, there's only one way to find out. No, there is not. And additionally, I have no interest in answering such a... Quiet. What's that? A passageway. Coming up on Michael's right, emanating a much brighter light. Michael noticed Flicker adjusting his eyes as he approached, dimming the surrounding areas to their normal levels of impenetrable black. Michael turned the corner. Nearly fell off it. He reached for the door frame with both hands, letting his rifle plummet. Grasped at the cool metal edges, holding with all his strength. His chest strained as his back curved in on itself, legs dangling, stomach dropping into the empty space. Scraped his heels, then soles, back onto the lip of smoothed metal. The rifle finally clattered to the floor, far below. He stood like that for a few seconds, arms pressed open, panting, staring. Below sat an open cavernous space. A massive cavity scooped out of the metal beast's body. Michael realised he was looking into its belly. The space might have seemed even larger if not for the heaps of clutter strewn over every surface. Toppled crane jibs jutted out from the floor and walls. Stacks of empty drums and containers lay scattered, and piles of scrap metal formed mounds that buried crushed trucks and a strange, black-bodied object with four tubular engines and a red cockpit. A gunship with legs? He spotted an elongated armoured body lying on its side, identical to its vine-covered brother he had found on the street a few days ago. A set of legs sprawled from the underside of its body, a few curled, more stretched out in various directions, like an absurd metal woodlouse flipped onto its side. A smaller, mirror image of the gargantuan beast it nestled inside. Had this wrecked hangar been the base of operations for the strange metal creatures? For the destroyers of the city? A shaft of moat-filled light shone from the ceiling, through a huge hole ripped into the top of the thick armour. It wasn't only the cooling light of day pouring in, but also the sounds of distant, synthetic explosions. The weapon creating that noise had to be more powerful than a blaster rifle. It sounded almost like... a turret... Who was firing it? There's a fight outside. Yeah, let's go see what's happening. Go towards the explosions? If someone's fighting the bandits, then they might be on our side. But 
I'm not running from another fight today. Flecker relented. Fine. I'm starting to realize calculated rationale doesn't appeal to your sensibilities. But if you do this, I'm only going to heal fatal injuries. Fine by me, Michael said as he lowered himself onto the first twisted ledge towards his gun lying far below. That still gives me an edge over everyone else. Ringing. Buzzing. Screeching. His ears were filled with too many high-pitched noises, and there was so much bright light. A clamp appeared in front of his eyes, provided only three thin shafts of shadow to shield his face. Must be dazed. He had actually expected a hand to appear when he raised his arm. Wit shook his head. All that did was make the world wobble and throb. He tried raising his other arm, but was met with resistance. He sluggishly turned his head. A wire was wrapped between bicep and forearm, making the flesh around it bulge. He groaned and dragged his clamp through the air, used a serrated edge to saw through the plastic coating, cut the metal wiring next. Slowly, so very, it sprang apart with a twang. Wit's brain started to churn again with his liberated body. He looked about himself. Shiny, sharp, sheared metal ends stared back at him. A distant boom momentarily replaced the buzzing in his head. He was lying down. Sat up, tiny pieces of debris tumbling from his chest. He'd risen too quickly. Head started to spin again. Wit rubbed at his back with his good hand, where he could already feel the pain welting. He'd taken a serious bruising. It hurt particularly on his lower back, where he'd fallen on his gun. Thrown against it. Thrust from his feet. The gunship. Strong. Shit. A shrill string of blaster shots fired above. Wit shrank back against the metal and wires, staring wide-eyed at the hole's gaping top. Like a scared, cornered animal. He arched his back, wrestling the gum from underneath him, and pointed it towards the sky. Like a scared animal, with a fully automatic assault rifle. His ears were still whining, a sure sign his tinnitus would be playing up tonight. And his front throbbed, like a giant hand had slapped him all over. Quite the force had come from that turret, but not enough for the concussive wave to kill him instantly. He guessed it to be 75 kilowatts. Any more, and he'd be dead. Surely, he could sit like this and wait for the battle above to end? It was uncomfortable, although a lot cosier than going upstairs, and if anyone stuck their head into view, he'd just shoot them before they had time to react. But what if there were more than one? What about grenades? or guns held out in front of the shooter, fired blindly into the small hole, turning him and his bed of wiring into cooked mints. Plus, there was Strong. He really should check on his partner of three years, or more likely Avenger. Then again, now she wasn't here to shout at him for running away. Maybe this was his chance to escape. Although, he was already on Tonkai's bad side, and it wouldn't look too good if he was found lifting weights in the gym while the Alliance whipped up a storm above the Freelancer's precious spy droid. Maybe he could escape the fort altogether, flee to Shank Mora, and start a fitness clam for all the drunks who wanted to lose their beer bellies. For all the farmers who needed a little muscle mass after their years of drug-induced lethargy. Or perhaps he'd hide out in no man's land, searching for a community of cowards like himself in the wastes. Most likely, this was all more daydreaming that would lead nowhere. A black blaster shot whipped through the sky above Wit's head, missing its target and seeking an alternative resting place. Wit didn't know what he'd do after this. The only way to find out was to take the plunge and climb out of the hole. Shit. He struggled to his knees and began to lift himself with one good arm, rifle handle grasped tightly in the clamp. It felt like a big event was about to happen, which wasn't a good thing. 
A life-changing moment you can see coming tends to be one of the bad sorts. He pulled himself up even more. What a sight he must be, little poof of dirt blonde hair slowly poking itself out of the hole. Wit took a deep breath and raised his eyeline the next couple centimetres. The gunship still hovered above, engines roaring, turret firing. However, it was turned the other way, nose directed north towards what must be Tonkai's patrol. What really concerned Wit was kneeling on the metal a few metres in front. A fully armoured soldier. Just one. His buddies must have descended the slope where the soldier aimed in the opposite direction of Wit. Still, one was enough to give him a long, long pause. No one in the fort dressed like that. All the armour on the island after the APOC had been sold to other factions or no man's landers, far away from the safe confines of the jagged fort. Only active frontliners wore armour, and there were none here. True, Strong used to be one, but she'd quit when the fighting between the factions dried up during the stalemate, and Wit had left after Tonkai promised him safe, well-paid work here on Prosperity. Not this. Not jobs that involved facing down fully equipped Alliance soldiers. He could tell the man was with the Alliance, not due to the armor's generic urban camo, but because of its shape. Wit was close enough to see the individual squares, tiny interlocking metal plates of Martesian steel, each coloured black, grey, or white, breaking apart and reforming into a hole as the soldier moved his head, flexing with the muscles. Those squares lined the whole bodysuit, ending at the ankles, wrists, and neck. A flexible protective coating with a single gap. One piece of the armour, the size of a squared domino, had come loose. Wit sucked his teeth and swapped the rifle into his good hand. A rifle carrying old-fashioned bullets with brass casings. He'd bought this heavy piece of junk as a showpiece. A spare to disguise the fact he'd lost his blaster rifle last week and hadn't felt like cashing out for a new one, vainly hoping it would show itself. There was hope for you, getting in the way again. How was he to know he'd be up against proper armour? Wit scanned his crater for a foothold. Nothing. And he was on a thin ledge as it was. He'd have to climb out to get a good clip of bullets into the guy. Shit. Wit sensed his body getting impatient as it moved for him, keen to get this over with, throwing the rifle onto a patch of moss that softened its clatter. The gunship's thunderous turret continued to fire directly above. Damn thing. Hoped someone else had a plan for dealing with it. Blaster rifles would barely dent its armour, and his own gun was a joke in comparison to those. He tried to lift himself all the way, but one clean movement proved difficult, clamp sliding across the surface. He turned about and propped his bum onto the slope's edge tucked his knees in and swivelled on his bottom until he once again faced the soldier's back, who thankfully hadn't seen any of the ludicrous display. He was too focused on the battle ahead, taking aim with his own weapon. Wit crouched into a kneeling position, copying his target and scraping up his rifle. Froze. Was this really the right thing to do? Probably a young man under all that armour. Could take an extra hit or two to take him down. Might be better to club him over the head. Hope the helmet didn't hold. The soldier shifted. The sudden movement made Wit pull the rifle's trigger, aiming for that small gap in the Martesian steel shell. The rifle jumped in his hands as it spat out a rattle of bullets. Wit kept the trigger down, making the weapon buck and thrust under his grip as it struggled to spring free like a massive power tool. The gunfire tore at his eardrums, nearly as bad as the air it ripped through. His tinnitus would be unbearable tonight. Under a monstrous blast of igniting gunpowder, Wit heard a series of tings as the bullets sparked against the armour. The soldier stumbled forward, placed a hand on the floor and steadied himself. Was that it? That was most of a clip at point-blank range! The salvo of bullets had proved worse than firing a water pistol. 
At least squirts of water wouldn't have attracted the soldier's attention, who was already turning to see who'd given him the slight shove. Everything slowed down with him, the twisting of the soldier's body controlling the momentum of time. Wit imagined the soldier's face, confused, startled, angry. Whatever the emotions, they were hidden behind the helmet and its darkened visor. He wouldn't even get to see his killer's face. All Wit had was his shirt and jacket. No use whatsoever against a blaster rifle. He just stood there, ready to accept the inevitable. Always knew he couldn't meet the mark. How unfair. The soldier finished his turn, raised his rifle, its muzzle ringing a black pit of barrel that would soon erupt in vibrant blue. Wit let the last, slow breath fill his ears, his chest relax and deflate. A calmness settled, the final resignation. The pit stayed dark. What was he waiting for? Wet tore his eyes from the gun to the soldier's helmet. Something stuck out from under it, between helm and shoulder. A knife protruding from the five millimeter slice of unarmored neck. Wit slid his eyes to the left, from the small hand holding the handle, along the white cloaked arm, to the hooded face. The sleeved arm twisted to the side and yanked the knife, stretching the gap and pulling out a chunk of fabric-covered flesh from between the squares. Time resumed as the figure stood, hood falling backwards. A great squirt of blood spewed from the soldier's neck, covering the cloak and splattering the newly revealed, toffee-coloured face. She smiled throughout the act. The smile of the speechless killer. The soldier's body collapsed to the side in a great wet clangor as the armour smashed against the blood-soaked metal. Wit didn't pay it much attention. His eyes were stuck on the killer's face, where flecks of red mingled amongst light freckles and dark brown hair. He looked into her light brown eyes. The lines deepened around them as the blood-drenched assassin continued to smile with full, closed lips. A chill took hold of wit, one far more frostbitten than staring down the barrel of the soldier's gun. Gods, that white-cloaked lady made this look too easy. Fenn heaved himself up the last edge, kicking his feet through the air as if that was meant to help propel him, and finally collapsed onto the sliver of balcony. He rolled over to face the dreary sky, gasping gulps of cold air. This must be his physical limit. Any more, and he would surely pass out. Fen, come help me with this. No rest for the hard-working souls of this world. Fen slowly got to his feet and turned to coffee and eyebrows waiting below, blaster launcher peeking between their shoulders. Watch what you're doing with that thing, Fen shouted as Coffee unloaded the launcher from his shoulder and shoved the first part onto the balcony's ledge. The shooty end, whatever it was called, directly pointed his way. You try carrying it for a while, Coffee complained. My shoulder's wrecked. Well, be careful. We don't know what could set it off. Coffee slid the launcher the rest of the way, making it jump and land with an unceremonious fud onto the balcony. Excuse you, Fen grumbled as Coffee swung himself onto the overcrowded ledge. Any more room? Asked eyebrows, one inquisitive brow level with Fen's feet. Um, how about you stay there and stand guard? Guard? The Alliance are moving in the opposite direction. The soldiers had climbed down the far side of the spy droid's head, little grey beetles chasing Tonkai's puny patrol further into the rubble. And there sat the gunship overseeing it all, bombarding the street fighting with its godlike wrath of turret fire, lighting up the whole area in translucent blue flashes. The very definition of a one-sided fight. What's the plan? Coffee asked. Fen nodded towards the gunship, whose massive back engine was at their level, creating enough noise and heat to put a forest wildfire to shame. Reckon we're close enough now, it won't have time to dodge. We're going to shoot a rocket right up its backside. 
That sounded pretty cool on my part. How are we going to do that? What do you mean? Coffee bent and cracked open the barrel of the launcher. We can't shoot it. There's nothing in here. What? There can't be... Fenn faltered when he saw Coffee's smile. Just kidding, he said, winking. The blaster cell's in here. Well, a bigger version of one anyway. How can you be making jokes at a time like this? Relax. I'm only having a little bit of fun. Guys, Eyebrow said from below. Fun? We're in the middle of a fucking battle here. My head was centimetres away from becoming a modern art piece. Guys. Okay, I get you're stressed, but there's no need to swear. I'll swear as much as, Guys, the fucking gunship? What? Fenn looked back at the battle, and the gunship, which had begun to rotate towards... Shit, get the launcher! Coffee had already picked up the weapon. He steadied it on his shoulder, took aim, one eye screwed solder tight. Hurry and fire! The gunship had finished half its turn and was treating the balcony to a side-on view of its angular body, smaller engines howling. Its blaster turret turned even quicker, rotating in front of its host. The launcher won't fire! Coffee, Fenn whispered through clenched teeth on top of weak knees. Not another joke. I'm serious, it's not working! Fenn heard the clicking as Coffee pressed the dead trigger. What should we do? He asked, voice suddenly frantic. Fuck this! Stray glass and debris scurried away with eyebrows as he leapt back down the rough path. The ledge below didn't seem such a bad spot now. There was no way they'd be getting back down the balcony in time for me imminently approaching turret. Fenn didn't move. Only stared. Like in school, when he'd had a bout of stage fright. The older kids snickered as he gazed past them all, looking directly into the cold eyes of his mother. Only this time, he stared into the cold blue A of the Alliance insignia, stenciled onto the side of the gunship. The Alliance or his mother? Which one should he curse in his final moments? The gunship fired, letting loose its thunderous blue payload, not at Fen or Coffee, but to their left, where eyebrows had been running. The whole building shook as the blaster shot collided, creating a river of cracks along the wall whose tributaries spread out to the balcony underneath Fenn's feet. The vibrations jolted him back to life. He heard a woman squeal, realised it was him. He looked around in a frenzy, nowhere to jump, everywhere a steep drop to the ground, far below. Fucking balconies. He looked back at Coffee, who still had the launcher propped atop his shoulder, staring in abject horror as if some demon had swooped down from the sky, just like the other night. Then, Fen remembered what they'd also done that night. He began to hit the launcher, making it sway on Coffee's shoulder, slapping it around the trigger where the cell rested inside. That's where it is, isn't it? What are you? The launcher came to life with a glorious symphy roar. It set the air ablaze as it spat out a tremendous black blast. It sailed through the sky, race car quick, and came to dock on the gunship's wing. The blast of energy exploded, engulfing the wing's engine in a black torrent. The right side of the gunship was flung back by the shockwave, skewing its next turret shot that flung wide of the balcony. The gunship continued to spin through the air, letting loose a corkscrew of black smoke and blaring alarms as it careened towards the ground. Fenn didn't see the rest of its journey. He turned and vomited over the edge, letting the thin contents of his stomach copy the gunship's fall to the ground. His head spun as he wished for a railing to lean against. Gods, I need a drink. And maybe a bite to eat first. She wasn't sure how it had managed the long journey across the sea, but Tamar loved watching the bald eagle that lived on prosperity, especially when it hunted. The way it hovered in the air, circling for prey. Noble and untouchable, so far above it all. Her favourite moment was when the mighty bird spotted its target, folding its wings into a teardrop shape as it dove in for the kill. 
the grey gunship looked just like that, an eagle beginning to fold its wings in for a dive, an action snapshotted and captured in metal. But the eagle had been hit, arrowed by a blaster shot. It spun towards the ground in a rigid fashion, impossible for an eagle to mimic. Men and women from Tonkai's party cheered as the ship went down. Another group joined their cheers. Tamar turned her head and saw the Southern Party running to join them. Yuna's group. They too must have left their truck behind in one of the jumbled streets. Always more comfortable to walk anyway. Tamar looked in the direction of the Alliance soldiers, armoured backs running towards the gunship where it was about to... Gone. The ship disappeared behind the spy droid's abdomen. The horrendous wrenching and crunching of thick metal hitting hard ground shortly followed. The Alliance's bludgeon had been smashed. The battle turned in an instant. Good riddance. To think that horrible man was about to kill poor Wit. The culprit's body lay next to her, oozing blood onto the sloped metal. Like a leaking, bloated snake covered in horrible metal scales. Tamar pivoted on the tip of her boot, flicking a spot of blood across the slick metal to face Wit. He stared at her with wide eyes. The attention made Tamar blush. She bowed her head, letting a few strands of hair drop around her face. She glanced up at him. He was still staring, right at her. Did he like her? A simple, needy thought, but she couldn't help herself. He wasn't being very subtle about it, although since it was sweet wit, she didn't mind. It was still cold, but Tamar kept her hood down. She sidled to him and heard his breathing quicken, shallow and shaky. She reached for his face, level with hers, and plucked away his sunglasses. The lenses were shattered with the frame intact, giving him a ridiculous look. He probably didn't realise he still wore them. The silliness of it almost made her giggle. With them gone, it revealed the full streak of scar across his face. It was an ugly thing, a white, puckered mass running from forehead to jaw, but that didn't matter. Wit remained silent. He must have been overwhelmed by all the excitement. Tamar was the same, giddy as a teenager. She had to control herself. Couldn't get carried away on this dead war machine. Time to reunite with the others. She stepped in line with Wit. It was amazing how big his arms were. She timidly reached for his hand, found a lump of metal instead. She'd forgotten about that. That didn't matter either. Slowly, Tamar glided back down the slope, leading Wit by the clamp. She felt her smile practically splitting the sides of her face. She squeezed the metal prongs. She was certain Wit would have squeezed back if he'd been able to feel anything there. What a wonderful day this had turned out to be. Coward! Come back here or I'll... Michael didn't hear the rest of the deranged man's words. The wind changed, snatching away his distant shouts. The red projectiles hissed behind. He heard them stop short and sizzle on top of the grassy paving. He was a long way from the metal beast now. Far from the second crack he'd found in the armour, an exit blown out of the underbelly, hidden by a thicket of grassy vines that led back into the square. Michael had fled. He didn't like it, but he was determined to find out who'd been causing all the commotion outside. He'd foregone the game of cat and mouse, scrambling about in dank corridors after an enraged opponent. He was tired of chasing rats in dark places. Tired of being the rat. What is that? Michael closed in on the plume of billowing smoke, its source obscured behind a gigantic length of metal leg. The smoke was coming from whatever had made that loud crashing sound a few minutes ago. Michael didn't have breath spare for Flicker, so he kept running, putting distance between him and his pursuer. He reached the wall of green encrusted leg, as tall as a lamppost, grabbed the nearest set of creeping vinery, 
pulled on it to confirm its strength, and began to grapple his way up the wall, pushing out with his legs as he leant back into a horizontal, seated position. You don't have much energy left. Michael ignored Flicker's words, well aware of the fatigue after his exertions of the last hour. Even the blaster rifle dangling from his back was taking its toll, weighing him down, urging him to quit. The thought only pushed him further. He would not be beat here. Top of the wall, Michael transferred his remaining strength to his arms and shoulders. Pushed, swung over the top and rolled onto the leg before crouching. He slowly stood as he realised what lay before him. The wreckage was a gunship. The twisted, broken wings and flaming tail were proof of that. The earth beneath had been churned up and the concrete smashed alongside the limb splayed body sprawled on the grass. It was none of these things that shocked Michael. He'd seen plenty of grisly crashes. His eyes were stuck to the sheet of metal lying in the grass, strewn from the gunship's side. In its centre was stenciled the letter A, intersecting the blue circle it sat within. It was a simple design, but one that made Michael's heart jump in a way it rarely had before. Like that of reuniting with a long-lost relative. A whole family who Michael had thought dead. And sure enough, there they were. Soldiers wearing sets of Martesian steel armour, the same as their fallen transport. A few of them had noticed Michael and were already advancing towards him, guns raised. I don't know if you have enough energy to escape them. Michael had no intention of escaping. He gently lowered his blaster rifle to the floor. Put your hands up, one of the soldiers shouted from the grass below, voice distorted by his helmet. How many are you with, and where are they? Michael did as he was told. Don't worry, he yelled, feeling slightly silly for having to shout down. I'm on your side. Who are they? More of the soldiers joined, ones not busy helping their comrades out of the wreckage. A few hesitated and glanced at each other when they heard Michael's words. They continued to look, from Michael to their neighbours, and began lowering their weapons. One man even took off his helmet to get a better look, mouth agape. Are they suspicious of you? They weren't. This was a different kind of reaction, one Michael knew all too well. The soldier giving the instructions hadn't caught on. On our side... And how can we know that for sure? James, the soldier next to him interrupted. Can't you see who that is? The soldier with a woman's voice lowered her rifle, stepped forward, and through the distortion of her helmet, asked, Is it really you? Michael braced himself for the next words, already knowing what they would be. Are you Michael Conway? Fenn used to hate afternoon naps, but in more recent years, he'd seen the appeal of wasting away the empty daytime hours. Plus, one hour of unscheduled sleep during the day had the mysterious effect of allowing plenty of extra drinking that night. It just went to prove that the human body could adapt to any situation. What a tiring day, Coffee said, repeating Fenn's thoughts. How about we go for a jog later? You know, Coffee, Fenn said as he stepped over a chunk of smouldering metal dislodged from the careening gunship. Going for a run right now sounds like the worst possible... Ah, lovely. A group came into view as they rounded a truck, standing in a semicircle shape. They had gathered next to the spydroid rather than the clearing where Massif's corpse littered the floor. Plenty of similar decorations had been installed that day amongst the street's clutter. A man stood atop the tip of the old weapon's dead eye, where metal met earth, marking where the lethal jaw of the spy droid lay buried. It was Tonkai, shoulders pushed back, eye reined in to only half a twitch, looking down on everyone from his raised position. Like a gaggle of disciples listening to the sacred words of the Messiah. The Southern Party had joined the crowd, led by the Steelbreaker woman, whose thin face Fenn recognised, but predictably, forgot the name of. 
She glanced over as they approached, as much approval in her eyes as that of the other clan chiefs. That was to say, not a lot. What's her... That's Yuna, Coffey whispered, preempting the question. Saburu's second. Then, Tonkai barked, interrupting whatever sermon he'd been giving to the blessed followers. Probably one concerning the saga of his arms business. Where were you? What the fuck has been going on here? Absolute pleasure to see you too. Why am I getting the grilling? Fen called back to Tonkai and his cohort of Skylers. Bingo was the one in charge. I just spoke to him. A man, undoubtedly from the Hollow Cloaks clan, piped up. He's given up on chasing the killer. He saw the man join the Alliance. A murmur went through the crowd, but Tonki wasn't about to abandon the spotlight so easily. So, Fen, how do you explain this? No mud monster? No mud demon? No result! Tonkai shouted, face morphing to beetroot purple. Instead, we have four dead, at least, and the Alliance's enemies. Do you have any idea what you've done? Hey, leave him alone. Coffee, Fen whispered, grabbing him by the arm. There's no need. I don't care what this guy has to say. He's not to blame, Coffee said, shaking away the cautionary hand. Fen's a hero. You have got to be kidding me. Another murmur went up from the crowd, as if they'd rehearsed their part in this pantomime. Explain, Yuna commanded. Who else do you think shot down the gunship? Coffee asked. Him? Someone asked, suitably incredulous of the statement. But he can't fight for shit, another said. Not untrue. Isn't he too old? Too old? Is this true? Yuna asked, one delicate eyebrow arched. Well, Fen said, scratching at his suddenly itchy cheek. It wasn't just me. It was all three of us. Three? Yes. Me, Coffee, and... Crap. What was his name? Can't call him eyebrows. It was bad enough the man had died when the gunship's blaster turret cut short his retreat down the building. Now he couldn't even remember the poor bastard's name. It's not my fault. We were never properly introduced. And... Where's Isaac? A deep-voiced newcomer asked. And Isaac, Fen announced, a little too enthusiastically. Oh, and Isaac didn't make it. He didn't what? Fen recognised the new speaker too late. Bingo had returned, standing amongst the quickly separating mercenaries, camo shirt smeared with dirt, grease and grass stains, his nostrils flared. What did you do to him? Bingo asked, directing his venomous spitting to Fen. Settle, Bingo, Yuna said, making Bingo's death stare swivel over to her like a cooked up owl. Fen's not to blame. He took down the gunship. There were mumbles of agreement. Oh dear, don't tell me they're actually buying that story. Two more people emerged from behind Tonkai, walking down the slope to join the rabble. Wit and the cloaked lady, Tamar the speechless. Wit certainly looked the part of a war-scarred veteran, covered in fresh bruises and a ripped shirt, and Tamar had managed to swap out her white cloak for a red... Oh. It was blood. Even more strangely, she led Wit by the hand, or clamp to be precise. Fen thought Wit was terrified of the woman he was now out for a pleasant stroll with. He was white as milk, and... Shaking, too? Must have been in shock from being the first man in living memory to hitch up with a woman during battle. Tamara was certainly happy, smile spread across her glowing face. Broken! Tonkai snapped at the coupling stepping by. What do you think you're doing with? He trailed off when he saw Tamar and her blood-soaked attire. She smiled at him, released Wit's clamp and slung her hood overhead, silently slipping into the crowd. No one made to stop her. Fen wondered, if he wore blood-saturated shirts and never spoke to anyone, would people leave him alone too, or lock him up in an asylum? Tonkai's glowering kicked back into gear once Tamar vanished. Broken! I'm paying you to work, aren't I? We're strong! 
At least she does a job when I tell her. All Whit managed to respond with was a feeble, Huh? Yuna was on her gauntlet, telling the fort to be ready for the Alliance's arrival, although how anyone could prepare for a visit from this guest was beyond Fen. Everyone! Bingo clambered onto the slope, literally overshadowing Tonky. Collect the dead and injured and fall back to the fort. We have much bigger problems to deal with now. Bingo caught Fen with a dangerous eye before storming off through the crowd. What would it take to get off his bad side? Flowers in a box of giant-sized chocolates? Not that it mattered. Everyone on the island was in deep shit now. The grip broke apart, grumbling amongst one another as people worked out how little they could get away with carrying for the long walk back. Alliance, eh? Coffee remarked, slapping Fen on the shoulder. Good thing we've got them on the back foot. Back foot? Of course. Now they've got no gunship. This should be easy. Easy. They'd just antagonised the third largest faction in the world. Or was it second? And how many freelancers were there? A few thousand? Yep. Easy.